So the last uh, talk of the session in the morning is uh, by Tatsuya Matsumoto. And it's now tell us all the information of TD ejector mass and it's going to of the TD model. Uh, thank you for organizers uh, giving me a chance to talk about my a little older work. But uh, yeah, this work was, I mean, this paper was published during the pandemic. So I did not have a good chance to advertise and talk about the stuff, the conference or meeting. So yeah, today I will talk about how to estimate the ejector mass during optical TDs. And it actually gives some interesting constraint on the optical TD emission model. So I'll begin with this famous picture. Just a very basic introduction when a star is approaching to the supermassive black hole and it's very center, it's smaller than Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, after the disruption happens, about half of the disruption. Uh, disrupted debris is bound to a supermassive black hole and it comes back. And in the classical theory, uh, classical, in the classical picture, people expected that this uh, horse back, pouring back debris makes a uh, Grecian disk and uh, it produces a very, so, uh, the pour back accretion rate is much larger than the Eddington rate. So we will see some very bright super. Edinton or Edinton soft exterior in a galactic nuclear region. And actually, uh, low salt sky survey detected such candidate, candidates. But, you know, in the last decade, TD oh. candidates are detected in optical bands. So they are basically happened, happened in the galactic nuclear region and that they does not show, they do not show uh, potential energy and activities, but uh, here the luminosity is 10 to the 4, typically 10 to the 44 L per second, so nearly a Dinton rate, and it continues about uh, longer than 100 days. And uh, the temperature is also very high compared to supernovae, so about uh, a few times, yeah, 10 to the 4 Kelvin. So clearly this observable was uh, inconsistent with classical picture. So people, yeah, this, uh, uh, yeah, people start to consider some theoretical model to optical, op optical transient, optical TDs. So here, uh, maybe interesting starting point to consider is just energetics. So here I'm showing potential. So here, uh, when a star is orbiting this, uh, energy is about zero and uh, approaching to this tidal radius and disrupt it. And uh, it's, it, uh, its specific energy distribution has some uh, widths. So here, red, blue one, this is bound orbit. And uh, it goes away and it comes back and it produces accretion disk on the two times tidal radius in the classical picture. But to, produce, uh, to make uh, such an accretion disk, such an accretion disk, you have to remove or throw away energy about 10 to the 50 to L. On the other hand, observationally, we are observing just the uh, radiated energy is about 10 to the 51 L. So this is so, yeah. So theoretically, we have a lot of energy to make an accretion disk, but uh, we are observing just uh, uh, about 10% of energy. So yeah. Sometimes uh, some people notice this fact, and uh, this is called, called inverse energy problem. So uh, somehow optical TD emission model should resolve this uh, <clears throat> inverse inverse energy problem. And uh, here I'm showing several theoretical models uh, proposed by people. Uh, I would not go in detail each model, but uh, basically in this model, uh, reprocessing model, I will focus on in a little detail for this model. In this for this model, <clears throat> so basically, in this model, accretion disk is produced uh, when a whole back debris comes back to the tidal radius, and the uh, promptly makes an accretion disk. But the most of the yeah, but the accretion pullback rate is much larger than the rate, so it would make some very massive 
disk wind. And uh, its velocity is about 0.1c or something like that, then most of the energy is removed as the kinetic energy of this outflow. So it resolves the inverse energy problem. And the other model, uh, yeah, so this model is uh, <coughs> you know, uh, considering the equation disk does not make a promptly, but the, as Clermont said, uh, for the pro uh, <coughs> stream stream collision happens and it makes some bright optical emission. And uh, we, we have heard this model from Brian to this level. And uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, still we don't know what is the exact emission mechanism of optical DDE. So, it would be very helpful to consider what kind of constraint we can get from observables. And uh, yeah, as I said, I'm focusing on this picture, reprocessing model, and uh, in particular, some of this outflow picture. So, yeah, originally, this is motivated by this consideration. So, if you see these two right curves, and uh, if I hide these names, you cannot maybe you cannot distinguish which is an optical DDs or supernovae. Supernovae. This is uh, a little uh, much brighter supernovae than typical supernova, and uh, its luminosity is interestingly comparable to the optical DDs, 10 to the 44 every per second, and its time scale is also much longer than typical supernovae. So, you know, this is explosion of massive stars. So it's typical ejector mass should be about 10 solar mass or something like that. But on the other hand, optical TDs, they have some similar characteristic observational signature, but uh, you know, when if typical disrupted star is some sun-like star, then the ejected mass should be about solar mass. But uh, the light curves are very similar. So this motivated me to estimate the ejected mass from the optical TDs. But the situation is a, bit, a little, maybe a little different from this uh, stellar props. So in, the, in this case, uh, supernovae, there are some sophisticated method or technique to estimate eject mass. But uh, here we have this wind. So mass is continuously ejected or supplied from the disk. So the situation can be different. So this is a motivation to develop a new technique to estimate uh, mass from optical, optical transients. Okay. So yeah, then I will talk about how to estimate ejecta mass from optical transients. So the basic point is I will estimate the condition in particular density and the radius of uh, of the optical emitting region by two observables. But uh, I have to make two basic, maybe natural assumptions. So this is uh, one is maybe ejecta is expanding spherically. This can be just, could be justified for most of the optical transients. And uh, the other is the emission is summer, I mean, black body emission. So this can be some general. Uh, assumption. In this case, uh, we can consider two characteristic radii. So one is diffusion radius. This is defined by optical depth tau is equal to c over v, v is the velocity of ejector. So the physical mean, uh, so tau is defined by this equation, you know. And uh, <clears throat> the meaning of this diffusion radius is like this. Within this diffusion radius, uh, uh, photons are scattering or absorbed by ejector many, many times, so very strongly coupled with ejector. But the outside of this diffusion radius, it can escape really. So we will we can observe uh, photons coming from outside of the diffusion radius. So the other radius is a little less popular. So this is so-called color radius. So this uh, the radius is also defined by this equation. Uh, yeah, this equation. The meaning of this color sphere is like this. So within this uh, color radius, photons are absorbed and re-emitted. So basically strongly coupling with uh, gas. So its temperature uh, should be the same due to the strong uh, absorption and the emission. But outside of this diffusion, no, color radius, the temperature could be different. I mean, uh, not in thermal equilibrium. <clears throat> so this is very basic point. I did not say anything special. And then, but uh, in these two general situations, we can consider some two situations. 
First, I will think, I, I think about this situation. Color radius is larger than diffusion radius. So physically, this means the photons are very strongly coupled with, coupling with gas and are absorbed and re emitted. And its temperature is the same with gas inside this color radius. But also outside of this color radius, it can be still scattered by electron scattering. I mean, yeah, scattered by gas, I mean, electron scattering, and then advected up to this diffusion radius. And when once this photon arrives, this uh, photon arrive at this diffusion radius, it can, they can escape from the, this radius. Okay, so there, I mean, observed photon temperature is determined the temperature of this diffusion radius. <clears throat> so in this situation, I can write down two equations. So one is so-called diffusion approximation. It gives bolometric luminosity from ejector. So basically this is some uh, gradient of energy density gives observed luminosity. And I make some approximation here. Then uh, you, you get this equation. Here the T is observed temperature. So this is basically observable. And then the other equation is a definition of tau. So yeah, here I also make some approximation, but uh, basically, yeah, if you know the velocity of optically optical emitting region, then yeah, basically you can estimate, uh, you can you can get this equation. So here I have two equations, but the two unknown quantity. This they are density and the location of the diffusion radius. So by using these two equations, I can derive, I can estimate. Uh, these quantities just by using observables. So then I can uh, construct this quantity m dot. So this means basically some outer flow rate from the diffusion radius. I mean uh, the mass flux at the diffusion radius. So then uh, so by integrating this outer flow rate with respect to time, you can estimate the amount of mass outside of the diffusion radius. You know, in the case of optical transients, uh, <clears throat> the ejector is expanding. So as time goes, the ejector density is getting smaller, lower and lower. So this diffusion radius is shrinks in Lagrangian coordinate sense. So this means as time goes, you can scan the ejector and uh, yeah, finally you can get uh, the amount of ejected mass outside of the diffusion radius. So similar technique can be used in the opposite case. The here a little situation is different, but uh, I will not go in detail. But uh, yeah, basically the calculation is the same by using the equations and the, by using observables. Uh, you can estimate the density and the location of color radius in this case. And again, by using these quantities, and uh, if you get velocity of the emitting region, then you can calculate m dot from color radius. Okay, so uh, this is some behavior as a function, of, uh, behavior of m dot as a function of velocity. There's a critical velocity, and if the velocity is smaller than this critical velocity, then color radius is larger than diffusion radius. And then the opposite case, the diffusion radius is larger. <clears throat> so yeah, Basically, I will uh, apply this technique to observe optical TDEs. But uh, before showing this result, uh, maybe you know there are more sophisticated or uh, historic, yeah, very well known technique to estimate ejector mass from optical transient. This is so called Arnett rule. So this tells us when the optical transient has a peak. So this peak time scale is basically comparable to the diffusion time scale from, from the ejector. So if you know the velocity of ejector, then and uh, if you can identify the peak in the optical light bulb, then you can calculate the ejector mass by using this technique. But uh, I would say this is the simplest technique and uh, basically assuming just a one zone model. So I mean, eject in this picture, ejector is uh, launched from some uh, stir instantaneously. 
And yeah, instantaneously. So this is the simplest picture. But uh, in this in my technique, I'm focusing on each flight curve segment and uh, focusing on uh, quantities of uh, shell mass shell emitting this uh, each times in each time. So yeah, basically there are several advantage. For example, I don't need peak time scale. For example, if we miss the right curve, a peak of right curve, of course I cannot use other rule, but uh, in, by using this technique, I can estimate, still estimate how much uh, estimate the how much mass is ejected at least observed part of the light curve. And uh, I'm focusing on, as I said, I'm focusing on each mass shell uh, emitting photon, photons at each time. So potentially I can reco uh, reconstruct the information of density, for example, density profile or energy distribution of optical hydrogen. So, um, yes. If you have a source that you don't understand, like the optical emission PT, yes. um, do you have a criteria that you can use just from observations to tell you whether we should be using our nets rule or the wind model? Well, we don't know what is the emission mechanism of the transient or even what is the nature about the problem of the transient. So at least if you want to apply R2, some ejector should be launched instantaneously, right? Mass should be conserved in the ejector. But uh, I guess this is not the case of optical TVs. Well, yeah, no, no, I understand the distinction. I'm just saying if you if I have a transient where we don't actually understand very well what's going on, mm -hmm. such as opt, such as TDEs, I mm -hmm. think it's fair to say that's the case. Then is there a way just observationally to tell whether you should apply the left or the right? I mean, one thing also is that um, I don't know sure if you mentioned it, but our net model generally assumes, I mean, David worked a little bit on changing this to me, but assumes that the heating rate is spread throughout the material. And so if you saw a very blue transient, you might expect it to be potentially from a convex object and therefore more likely to be a more wind-like model. So that's one of the potential. So I think the answer is no, but I was curious. Yeah. Meaning I agree in general, it's really hard to know yeah. without more information. It's somewhat related question. So if I now, so can you use your more sophisticated model to try to you know boil down to some scaling relation signal to what a net rule provides, and does it look like you know are those scalings right, and you are getting some coefficients in front, or you are getting a different? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I mean, no, that's fine. So with your more sophisticated model. Uh -huh. Are you able to you know capture the pieces of that in sort sort of a, um, a scaling relation like you have for Arnett's law? Mm -hmm. And does that look similar with some you know coefficient or you actually get different dependencies? Uh, or, or it cannot be boiled down into I think the physical dependence dependence should be the same, but the numerical coefficient should be different because you know uh it's a little uh Depends on what is the density, exact density profile or velocity profile. So, yeah, some numerical factors. Are... I think in the wind, each shell basically obeys something like Arnett's law. So, it would be like you're still calculating where T diffusion equals T expansion and estimating a density there, and then you're adding up a bunch of shells over top. That's the big difference. So, so in general, generally, you depend on the, you know, the shape of the light curve and Okay, uh, thank you for the questions. Well, yeah, so I would say, yeah, this technique has some kind of advantage over previous techniques. And, uh, you know, in this method, I don't have to assume any uh, energy source of optical transient. So in the last part of this talk, I will emphasize, but uh, in the future, maybe we will detect a lot of some peculiar or completely unknown transient. And in this case, my, maybe my technique can apply for to estimate the ejector mass for this transient. And uh, maybe it will give us some good insight what is going on in these transients. So first of all, before applying this technique to optical TDEs, maybe you should know, you, have, you want to know what is the result for the, the other more common transient. And I will show the result for uh, supernovae. You know, this, 
transient has a very, very long history, and uh, there are a lot of soft, more sophisticated, sophisticated uh, methods to estimate ejector mass. So at least we know massive stars exploding in this uh, transient. So yeah, we can get some, we can compare what my technique will tell us. <clears throat> So yeah, the, I'm using this. Uh, I'm applying this my technique to analyze this transient, uh, this supernova type one C. Type one C means there's a no hydrogen and the helium. So this is basically the exp explosion of carbon or oxygen star, and uh, this is observed the light curve and the time evolution of the temperature. So yeah, this is just what I need in my calculation, and then in particular, uh, in the case of supernovae. We don't basically we don't need the information with velocity because in this case homologous expansion is a very good approximation. So at least you know when this uh, supernova happened. I mean the beginning of the explosion. I mean time. Then you can once you know the radius of the ejector, then you can estimate. Uh, you you know what is the velocity of the ejector. So the reason why I pick up this one supernova is. I don't have to take into account some complicated physics related to opacity. And then I'm adopting electron scattering opacity for typical value for uh, type 1 C supernovae, and the uh, absorption opacity is uh, represent the bound bound opacity. This is a real uh, tricky point, and I'm just picking up some ballpark number from this paper. But uh, you know, my calibration is completely analytic, so you will see what is the effect if I adopt different opacity value. Okay, so just a question. Yes. Um, in principle, this absorption opacity is widely dependent on frequency. So yes, yes. Does this mm -hmm. value correspond to one specific frequency? Mm -hmm. is it so this is Frank mean opacity, so corresponding to the observed temperature. I mean. You know, opacity is depend has a dependence on yeah. frequency, and then but I'm yeah, yeah. Uh, taking up average by I mean, convolution. Convolution, I don't know, but okay. uh, Planck, uh, Planck body function. Planck average. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, basically, we are focusing on Planck body radius, which makes photons, which has characteristic frequency about three kT. Or something like that. So the opacity is corresponding to this temperature, this frequency. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a result for the application to this type one supernova. Uh, here, I'm, by just by using this luminosity of the temperature, I can calculate the time evolution of the color radius and uh, mass flux at this color radius and the uh, resulting ejected mass outside of the color radius. So Initially, this color radius is expanding, first expanding in both Lagrangian and Eulerian coordinate. But after some light curve has a peak, the color radius starts to shrink. So then, this is a moment most of the mass is passing through this color radius. So it then uh, M dot has a peak around this uh, around this moment. And the final, uh, our final result is uh, estimated ejector masses to roughly two solar mass. And this is nicely consistent with uh, <clears throat> result by new maker simulation by these authors. Very nice consistency. But uh, this is the best example. <laughs> so I applied for other, uh, <clears throat> other type 1C supernovae uh, taken from this paper. And uh, maybe, uh, well, so this is a result given by hydrodynamical machination by these authors, and uh, this y-axis uh, represents our estimate. But maybe this, this is the uh, best figure you should pay attention. Uh, this is the ratio between our estimate and the numerical simulation. And uh, this is a histogram. So our estimate is a little underestimating the uh, ejector mass suggested by numerical simulation about factor of a few. Maybe partly the coverage of right curve is not complete, so we are missing some part. And uh, yeah, so this could be the reason. So 
Yes. Question, just make sure I'm understanding. So you're saying that you're, you're both this hydro simulations and your analytical method are trying to approximate observed light curves. And you're just comparing the masses that you get versus yes. the simulation. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, in the community of supernovae, this accuracy, people do not call this is accurate uh, because, you know, they want to know stellar evolution or yeah, the final mass of the star. This is, this is calculated by more sophisticated numerical goals. But uh, I would like to apply this technique. I mean, I would like to estimate the ejected mass of completely unknown object. I mean, TDs or more exotic transients. So this accuracy could be acceptable, I would say. So yeah, this is the final of my main, main result. So applying to this technique to estimate how much mass should be ejected from optical transient, optical TDs, I'm using, I'm adopting, I, I, I'm picking up these three very famous uh, optical TDs, and uh, this is the time evolution of luminosity and the temperature. The temperature is basically constant, but uh, I would say in, the, in this case, we do not have an optical peak, so clearly we cannot apply RF to, to estimate ejected mass from these TDs. And uh, here I'm thinking maybe these optical TDs are produced by disk wind. So just fixing the velocity about uh, 10,000 kilometers per second. And uh, just calibrated, ejected the mass from these, these three optical TDs. So you see uh, clearly just after a month, after the explosion and uh, disruption or detection, a required ejector mass exceeds the one solar mass. So, and the final result, yeah, the final amount of mass, I mean, the final result is about five or 10 solar mass is required to produce this very bright optical transient. So this means the situation could be very similar to, well, super luminous supernovae, right? <clears throat> So, but I'm, I'm using just a one value of velocity. So I changed, uh, I, calcul I carried out the same analysis for different velocities. So the y uh, x axis, this is velocity and the y axis, this is obtained ejected mass. So, <clears throat> so basically around this, uh, about 10,000 kilometers per second, this is suggested value of, uh, reprocessing a model. And if I use this velocity, then required ejector mass is fixed about one solar mass. This is typical mass budget of optical TD, uh, TDs. So yeah, and actually this calculation suggests the outflowing velocity should be very much a little smaller, much smaller than this 10,000 10, 10, km per second. And, uh, Maybe comparable to escape velocity. So, the out, if optical TD is uh, produced by outflow reprocessing outflow, then their velocity is much smaller than expected by original model, and uh, potentially this reprocessing materials are uh, bound to the supermassive black hole. So, yeah, this implies. Maybe the reprocessing material should be not out of rule, but the envelope or favorite these uh, different models. <clears throat> so now I'm finishing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm just uh, making sure what, what's how, how, how much time I'm. I have we have, we have it. 10 more minutes in total to before going. Ah, okay, that. okay. So then, yeah, this is just a few strikes. So I, in the beginning of this talk, I just uh, emphasize in the future, we will observe a lot of more and more transients. I mean, in the case of supernovae, it, the number of detection is will be increased about 10 times by the operation of Ruby Observatory. And uh, we potentially we can feel a lot of more new types of transient in this diagram. I mean, time scale and the luminosity. This is phase space of transients. <clears throat> so in this case, maybe we don't know what is going. Uh, maybe we will detect completely unknown transient, and uh, it would be very useful to dis use this technique to <clears throat> uh, parameters of optical transient. So this is just a pre preliminary result, but uh, you know this is brightest of 
now not the brightest, but the kind of one of the most brightest of the tangent, as I say, 15 RH. Uh, this was claimed to be optical TD, or but but sometimes people are believing maybe super and super. So you know, basically, we don't know. But uh, I applied just uh, using this luminosity and temperature and estimated how much mass it should be ejected in the picture of this wind or uh, wind with uh, this velocity. And the required mass is exceeding 100 solar mass. So clearly, there's something, something wrong in this assumption of my calibration setup. So this gives just a constraint on the models, but uh, I would say it should be, it's still useful to use this technique to analyze optical problems. So this is a summary. Thank you, thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. No. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, in what, you know, there was this previous work by uh, Nathan Roth. And uh, I think there are a couple of differences between what you're doing and what is doing. Maybe the most important is that they were assuming some uh, static envelope. I wonder if you can generalize your work by adding some kind of radius dependent velocity profile. So you can use the same technique to put constraints on what the velocity profile in this envelope could be. Yes, yes, yes. if we know what is the velocity of ejector, yeah. then by just by uh, here in this calibration, I did not assume any complicated pro velocity profile of yeah, ejector, yeah, yeah. and assuming just a constant velocity. But yeah. if we know, if we can, we, we know the yeah. velocity profile, then of course we can apply. Because the, if you understand correctly, the velocity that matters in your model is the velocity at the color, what you call color radius. Mm -hmm. And so as long as the velocity at that radius is small, then you can allow for low ejector mass. Right. So I'm thinking of something that expands and then you know it's bound, so it reaches some upper center, and maybe the upper center is close to the maybe by coincidence it's close by the to the color radius, and so you can still allow for a large projectile mass in that case, right? Well so sorry, um, as, as long as the velocity at the color radius is small, mm -hmm. you can allow for a large. Ejectment. Uh, you can allow for low ejectment. Yes. You don't yes, have this yes. problem of having. Uh, right, right, right. It depends on, yeah, velocity is very important yeah, right, yeah. in this calibration. So yeah. but maybe, maybe going going a bit further than just assuming constant velocity and saying, you know, this range is not allowed because it's too, too high in ejectment. Maybe it would be good to also, if possible, generalize this model to a radius dependent velocity profile and see you know, what kind of profile you can get. Mm -hmm. Maybe something like one of them. Whatever R squared. Yeah, escape velocity, radius dependent escape velocity. Yeah, I can I can or some bound profile mm -hmm. starting from escape velocity close to escape velocity to zero at some range. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other way to reduce the estimated ejector mass is considering some non-spherical case. Yeah, yeah. Here I'm assuming completely spherical case, but yeah. uh, a uh, the straight, uh, I mean, reprocessing envelope has just a half of he and hemisphere, and the ejected mass could yeah. be smaller. Or yeah, lar larger opacity as well. I mean, I guess right, 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 right. Yes. And but just <laughs> one, mm -hmm. one last question: the, What about the assumption of black body emission? Because I know that uh, this Roth paper, the optical emission was coming from the fact that. The outgoing spectrum was not black body, it was mm. a black body and then a tail, and the optical was coming from this tail. So, I guess if you assume, if you want to assume black body, that will also reduce the optical you can get for a given. Yeah. Mass. So yeah, I think, yeah, yes. I did not check how, I, I mean, I do not have any <laughs> technique to extend this yeah, yeah. method to non black body emission. I think may, maybe the black body assumption uh, arises from the fact that you assume. That the color radius is frequency dependent. Yeah. So maybe that's possible to. Well. Yeah. But yeah, I, I I try. <laughs> yeah. Lena, you had a question. 
Oh, yeah, I was just wondering about the assumptions for the source uh, radius of the luminosity. So are you assuming a black body at like the, uh, I think this is related to one more question. So I almost answered it, but are you assuming just a black body at like the circularization radius? I didn't ask if any some uh, yeah. Okay. Just, uh, yeah, this method is just okay. using only observable. So I, I'm kind of agnostic what is going on, but uh, yeah, just estimating how much mass is just required to produce observed luminosity and the temperature. So kind of model independent, I would say. Yeah. The other exercise that would be interesting is Clement has a radiation hydro light curve from the TD simulation. So you should apply your method to that and see how much mass you infer. Yeah, actually, this should be very knows how much mass is in the simulation. So that would be interesting. Yeah, applying his results and check. Uh, yeah. check the consistency between the technique and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. this. I think this would be part. For sure, this would be part of the radius dependent velocity. <laughs> and then maybe I mean, you can calculate. I guess is that this would be the, the way to make that yeah. agree with each other. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Um, the same to you again. Thank you.